Hey everyone, welcome back to Clinical Physio with me, Khalid Maidan. Today's quick fire Q&A is all about the shoulder and scapula. Five questions, 10 seconds to answer each one. So question number one, which two of these four muscles combine to laterally and upwardly rotate the scapula? And time's up. So the two correct answers here are serratus anterior and the upper trapezius muscles. Question number two. How would you complete a scarf test and what does this test for? All right, time's up. So here is a picture demonstrating how a scarf test is completed, whereby the therapist slowly brings the shoulder being tested into increasing horizontal adduction by drawing the flexed elbow towards the opposite shoulder. This is a test for pathology of the acromioclavicular joint, known as the ACJ for short. And on to question number three. What key differences would you expect to see between a frozen shoulder and a rotator cuff tendinopathy in terms of a patient's age and range of movement? All right, time's up. So here are some examples. A frozen shoulder has a very consistent age bracket, with a patient's age being between 40 and 60 on average. In Japan, this condition is called the 50-year-old shoulder for good reason. A rotator cuff tendinopathy, however, can occur amongst patients in a much wider age bracket. It is quite possible to have a rotator cuff tendinopathy whether you are age 28 or 68, whereas a patient of these ages is very unlikely to have a frozen shoulder. In terms of range of movement, patients with a frozen shoulder will most likely present with equal active and passive movement restrictions, with a capsular pattern, whereby external rotation is most significantly restricted at around 10 degrees at the height of stiffness. Range is very likely to be stiff or blocked at its end range. With a rotator cuff tendinopathy, it is possible to demonstrate active and passive restrictions, but active range of movement may well be more restricted than passive due to active tendon loading. Restrictions may present in a much wider variety of ranges, where patients could achieve close to end range flexion, for example, which is very unlikely for a frozen shoulder. Patients with this condition do not necessarily fit a capsular pattern. All right, on to question number four. Which muscles insert into the greater tubercle of the humerus, and what is the importance of this? Time's up. So the three muscles in question are the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. The importance of their insertion is that this provides anatomical reasoning as to why these muscles each have a role in external rotation of the glenohumeral joint. Recent research has found that whilst the latter two muscles are known as the most common external rotators, the supraspinatus also has a role in this movement. And finally, question number five. The patient with the following symptoms presents in your clinic. They are a 74-year-old male with a sudden increase in left shoulder pain after they had a fall two weeks ago in which they fell on their left side. The patient reports that they went to A&E immediately after the incident where an x-ray showed no bony injury. They present to you with reduced active range of shoulder movement where they only have 50 degrees of flexion and abduction and they also have significantly reduced power. So 10 seconds, what do you think their problem is at this point? Okay, time's up. But here's one final clue. What if I told you that this patient's passive range of left shoulder movement was absolutely fine? Okay, let's talk this through. So the most likely diagnosis in this instance is a rotator cuff tear. The patient's age tells us that their rotator cuff is likely to be more susceptible to a tear, and potentially a full thickness tear. As his onset of symptoms came after a trauma, his possibility is raised further. The fact that he had no bony injury on x-ray clinically rules out a fracture or a dislocation. Finally, the significant reduction in active range of movement and the reduction in power tells us that there may well be an injury to contractile structures. 
the fact that the patient has no issues with passive range of movement indicates that articular structures are likely to be unaffected and implicates contractile structures even further. If you wish to confirm the diagnosis of a rotator cuff tear, you could use clinical tests such as a drop arm test, the lift off test, or the external or internal rotation lag tests. And that completes our video. Thank you as always for watching and for all our best tips and videos, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and keep watching Clinical Physio.